Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for those kind introductions. Uh, and I have a couple of small modifications. Uh, as of three weeks ago, I passed my thesis defense, so I get to be PH done instead of a, <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, instead of a PhD candidate, which is quite exciting. Uh, and I'm so thrilled to be in Philadelphia. This is one of my favorite cities. I've been here a number of times and to be a part of the Philly ETE community. I'm learning what a Philly ETE thing is. Uh, I've got the t-shirt, I'm gonna investigate um, and getting to meet a couple of you already. This has been such a wonderful experience so far. Um, so yeah, today I'm gonna talk about choreo robotics and essentially how we can teach robots how to dance. Um, so I'll provide a little bit of an introduction about why this field exists, why it's growing, and where it's headed. So this is really my vision for the future of robotics. Humans and robots can intuitively, creatively interact such that humans feel empowered, safe, and inspired by robots. Because robots are changing. They're sort of living among us. They're doing all kinds of useful things, but even more so, they're becoming a part of our daily lives. And what kinds of interactions do we want to have with these robots? And really, the motivating questions for my work in general, my research work, and my artistic work is, how can we better leverage human knowledge when we're teaching robots? And what kinds of novel experiences can we create that leverage a robot's features as both a utilitarian tool and as an evocative social agent? The big difference between a robot and a computer, is, as my friend and colleague Benji Holson put it, is that a robot moves, right? There's a really, that's highly, highly significant. And when we think about things that move, who works on things that move? Dancers, choreographers, biomechanics. Right. These are the kinds of intersections that I'm going to illuminate over the course of my talk. And I care about all of these kinds of questions very deeply because of my background. So I graduated from UC Berkeley. I was born and raised in Berkeley. Uh, I was a professional dancer for some time, sort of grew up dancing. And then around 2017, I started dancing with robots. This is with the Baxter robot. This is an industrial robot from Rethink Robotics. And this experience of getting to dance with robots was such a rich and compelling test bed for questions around agency, control, interaction, that I thought, I want to do this for the rest of my life. And I'd also like to torture myself a little bit, so I went to grad school. And that's how I wound up at Stanford uh, and have been there for the last five years, just finished up, like I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, uh, and spent half of my PhD as the artist in residence at Everyday Robots. So these aren't the only robots that I've used in my work. Um, through this time, I've gotten to work with so many different form factors. Uh, this is like a now robot in that upper left corner, which is this sort of small baby-like robot humanoid. Obviously, these mobile manipulators that I'll talk about in great detail from everyday robots. These sort of big, large industrial robots in the bottom left corner. Again, the Baxter. And then I've also gotten to work with Boston Dynamic Spot. And this is probably half the robots that I've used. Uh, so if you're curious about robot programming, you want to know uh, how all of these different robots are programmed, I'd be happy to talk with you after the talk. Uh, but they all have each their own intricacies. So one question that might be coming up for you is like, really, what do robotics and dance, you know, what, what does it have in common? And I mentioned that the main difference between a robot and a computer is that a robot moves. But I think Barbara Tversky says it better than I do. She says humans have been moving and feeling much longer than they have been thinking, talking, and writing. I'm not sure I would agree with Barbara about the thinking part. <laughs> uh, but I think that she's probably right in terms of these formalisms around language, spoken language. And written language, they really, I mean, we didn't have those. We were sort of running across these big fields and picking berries and couching ourselves over fireplaces and you know, long before we were doing more of these sort of written formalisms about speaking and writing. Uh, and I think it's really important to open with her because she sort of captures the essence of just how important movement is to the human experience. Movement is this core evolutionary quality of who we are how we translate thought into action, and how we perceive the world. Look at these kids in this photo. No one really told them how to play, right? No one explicitly taught them how to navigate around another kid, how to chase a ball, especially. Um, 
they just sort of have this intuitive expectation of how they can move and navigate through and around one another such that they don't bump into each other. And so we have this very innate understanding of movement. Uh, and also, you can't really do anything unless you move. You can't, I mean, as of right now, we don't have Neuralink yet. You can't write code without moving your fingers or speaking out loud. You can't construct a house without maybe teleoperating a, a crane or sticking a brick on top of another one. So movement, it's this very essential part of our daily lives. And we maybe don't think about it as much as we should because it's just something natural that happens. And in fact, movement is so important that the reason we might even have a brain is to move around our environment in a meaningful way. So Bruce Hood, who's this experimental psychologist, and he's a neuroscientist at the, at the University of Bristol, he says, the primary purpose of a brain is to move around our environment in a meaningful way. In fact, one could even argue that most of the brain is dedicated towards action. If we consider that the basic building block of the brain is the neuron, then it comes as a surprise to most of us to find out that the majority of neurons are not in the association cortex, where the higher thought processes are generated, but of these 86 to 100 billion neurons, 80% of them are found in the cerebellum, which is the base of the brain at the back that controls your movement. And I provide this example of a sea squirt because these float and swim all around the ocean very efficiently. And when they sit and they find the rock that they want to sit on for the rest of their lives, they eat their own brain because they no longer have to move. So it's not just an essential part of kind of how we socialize and interact, but it might even be a couple of posited arguments, might even be why we even have a brain at all. And movement is so critical when it comes to our perception of the world. So movement can shift in meaning. And I want to provide a couple of examples of studies that have illuminated this. So there's this study on the far left. It's just this random collection of black and white dots. And they're moving around a screen. And they're completely random. There's no rhyme or reason how and why these dots are moving in this direction. And people look at these moving dots and they go, oh, I'm experiencing affect. They make me feel sad. Right? They make, this reminds me of a tree. It gives you reference. It's just a random collection of moving dots on a screen, right? And people are inferring all of this implicit meaning out of them when there's really nothing there. It's just a whole bunch of moving dots. And they've replicated a similar thing with these kinds of moving geometric shapes or these bodies that have been bifurcated. So this very impoverished representation of a body on the far right. Again, people are inferring affect. They're inferring context. They're inferring memory all from these completely random representations of movement. And so you can start to put these pieces together that not only is movement a really important part of the way that you know, our anatomy is structured and the way that we relate to each other, but also the way that we perceive the world around us. And if you take it a step further, OK, what's moving? Robots move. And robots move autonomously. So they move around humans in these unstructured environments. This is an HV. This was like an early prototype from everyday robots. Uh, and they're moving around in these fully autonomous ways. And so all of these different parts of our brain are being triggered. Oh my gosh, what does this movement mean? Why is it so compelling? What, is the, what does this action mean relative to this action? And I might even posit that robots are the only thing that move in our environment autonomous, autonomously that are not a part of nature. You could make this argument for trains. You could make it for cars. But those are all being conducted. right? There's somebody who's standing back there. Squirrels move autonomously. Trees move autonomously over the course of the wind. But we don't have many things that move in our environment autonomously that are not a part of nature. So we're opening this brand new paradigm of what does this movement from robots mean in the context that we live in on a regular basis. And here are a couple more examples of some of these embedded robots. You know, This is still a little bit more of a research project, but it's making its way out. This from Toyota Research Institute on the left these Badger technology robots that are scanning different aisles. And then, of course, everyone's seen the spot robot. But a lot of them were deployed to do some temperature sensing in hospitals, especially during COVID. And again, you know, movement is one of the primary ways that we perceive and interact with robots. This is a Kiwi bot moving around in the environment. It's not driving around and telling everyone, I'm going straight, I'm going right, I'm going left. It's just moving, right? And that's enough to give people a signal about what's happening. So we put these ideas together. Movement is a very fundamental part of what it means to be human. Autonomously moving robots are coming out of the factory and into our spaces. 
And so if we're going to be around robots, the movement centers of our brains, they become very engaged. And movement is a powerful way to make robots more effective and accepted by the general public. Who is an expert at making and designing movements? Choreographers. So I'm gonna talk now about some shared motivations and challenges between roboticists and choreographers. And we're gonna do this through something that's slightly experiential. Okay, so I know that we're all at a developer conference, which means that everyone has a laptop, but find a friend who has a piece of paper and a pen. Is this a high, a high bar? Okay, we have a friend who has a stylus, piece of paper and a pen. Perfect. Hopefully everyone will have a piece of paper and a pen, or at least be allowed to write on the piece of paper with the pen of the friend that you just met. Okay. And we'll give it like 20 more seconds. Very old school I'm hearing, it is old school. Yes, we need pieces of paper and pens. Okay, everybody good? We're all good? And hopefully you can still see me on the camera. So I'm gonna do a couple of moves and you, without words, no words, are going to draw what happened on your paper, okay? No words, I'm gonna do a couple of moves, you're gonna draw what happened on your paper. No right or wrong way to do this. No existing for all the musicians out there who are like, I know how to annotate this, a plus for you, but again, no right or wrong way to do this. Okay, and I'll do it twice. Okay, one more time. Okay, did we all draw? Keep drawing. We all draw, we're drawing, everyone's got. I'm not gonna do it again, so hopefully you watched. We're good. I'm gonna give it like 20 more seconds. Okay, and then grab a partner and show them what you drew and have them show you what they drew. Let's come back together. Who drew the same thing as their partner? No hands are raised. <laughs> Who drew something very different than what their partner drew? A few hands are raised, okay. Uh, was this easy? Yes, no, okay. Um, can we have a pair of people who maybe drew things that were very different talk about it for a second? Do we have any volunteers? I, I know that, yeah, oh, how about right over there. So what did you draw and what did your partner draw? So my partners are drawing right now. Um, <laughs> but mine was, mine was a line. You drew one line? One line, okay. one continuous line. Okay. It's the way I see the world. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, why did you draw it. one continuous line? Uh, your movement was continuous. Movement was continuous, okay. Maybe it has been over the course of my entire life. Wow. Uh, <laughs> so finish that thought. So the movement was continuous. What was continuous about it? Uh, just the general flow of it. Okay. Um, I guess it had sound to it. I kind of thought of it as a, like a sound. Okay. Which, now that I think about it, makes no sense. Uh huh. But, yeah. So there's a time-based aspect to what he's describing, right? It's continuous, right? Which means that there was something that gave it a block to have a beginning and an end. And it also seemed to have some relationship to the other movements, right? They didn't seem isolated. That's why you said it was continuous. Correct. Okay. Let's have somebody else maybe volunteer. What did you draw? What did your partner draw? What was interesting to you about the, the 
contrast between the two. Yeah, we, we have the partner. Let's hear from yeah. you. So I had a stick figure with kind of a circle okay. hand and then three clapping kind of motions with the sound being the thing that would denote sound <laughs> there and then stomping with the feet. So I think I took it as like three, three separate movements. Three separate movements. Fascinating. Why were there three separate movements? Because I felt like whenever I, I felt like the three main things I noticed was the, you know, the hand in the circle, the clapping and the stomping. Right. So it seemed like they were distinct because there was a change in direction. There was a change in the sound or the tempo, right? And they also seemed to have different, I mean, facing is, or maybe different parts of the body that were moving. Yeah? Right, yeah. Okay. Any, anybody else want to comment on how easy or hard this was for you? Yeah, one in the back. We have a microphone on the way for all of our live streamers who hopefully also did this exercise. So the thing I noticed is that we both pretty much drew the same general thing mm -hmm. um, in different directions, first of all, which was fascinating to me. Um, but uh, it, it was hard. Well, actually, I don't, I'm not sure it was really hard, actually. Okay. Um, what I like about how similar they are is that they're, um, they're discrete actions. They're linear. There's motion. Um, it's separated into its parts. But the, the relationship of the different parts. So, mm -hmm. for example, the little stomping is small in both of our drawings and, and sort of discrete small steps. Mm -hmm. so the, I guess the, uh, I want to say the degree, the amplitude yep. of the different motions is reflected in the drawings, which is, I didn't really expect it until we started to actually draw it out. So awesome. it wasn't just the movement, it was the degree. Yeah. It was Thanks, everybody, for these comments. I think, so we've illuminated a couple of things which seem to be core essentials when it comes to talking about and describing movement. We have something about scale, right? So we have scale in the back. A small stomp is different than a very big stomp. We have something about linearity and continuity and ordering, which also seems to be very important in movement. We have something about the parts and shapes of the body, right? And so the relationship that those have, whether it's an arm-based action or a foot-based action. And all of these things are pretty hard to describe in notation, right? They're just hard. Like, oh, um, here, here's a, an example of one of the ones that I drew for a dance that I did a couple of months ago, where we have this like big swirly motion and a bunch of dots, and then there's an arrow, there's some directionality, there's some facing involved. But it's really, really hard to capture and convey movement. And this is a challenge between choreographers and roboticists. So choreographers describe and translate movement through scores, teaching, and recording. These are two very famous modern dance choreographers, Merce Cunningham, Lucinda Childs. They've created their own notation. These are actually dances. So these are dances that their dancers can look at and learn from these sheets of paper. And they have some directionality involved, right? There's like some notion of space. You can see where the actual corners and those lines are drawn. There's color coding. I mean, this is like essentially a form of a programming language that they come up with for their own choreography. But not only do choreographers describe and translate movement through scores, teaching, and recording, but roboticists do the exact same thing. So we describe and translate movement through these recordings, demonstrations, equations, and a little bit more. So this is an example of a GUI for, from SoftBank Robotics that is for controlling that little now robot that I showed you at the beginning of my talk. And you can see that there's something very time-based, right? So you have these boxes that are ascribed to different parts of the robot, and then they're interlinked and interwoven together, and they play in this sort of sequential order. So you have a timeline that's allowing you to move. And in this case, this is a VR system that I've used a lot in my work, uh, where you can hook it up to have the end effector essentially be mapped to the VR controller and the person just move the robot around by swinging their arm in space, which is not wildly dissimilar than watching a demonstration from another human and replicating it yourself. So we have these very similar modalities for how we achieve different kinds of tasks. We also, roboticists and choreographers, they might utilize state machines. Maybe they want to allow room for some uncertainty, for some choice making over the course of the performance. So you can have these slight formalisms that are going to allow you to have a little bit of uncertainty inside of the work that you're making. So here's an example of a very rudimentary state machine for a robot that's just sort of moving and waiting for it to do something. And then here's an example of a famous piece from Rebecca Legere on the right at Princeton, where she basically just 
created this giant state machine, all the dancers memorized it, and then they used cues from one another and from the musicians to transition in between these different states. So every time you saw the performance, it was completely different. Choreographers and roboticists, they also rely upon cues and patterns to convey legibility and intent. This is Misty Copeland uh, in The Firebird from American Ballet Theater. And for someone who has never seen this dance, what is happening in this image? Any volunteers? Might be another, yeah, what, right in. Phoenix is being reborn. It looks like a phoenix, why does it look like a phoenix that's being reborn? The feathers and the red color of the imagery is what I would associate with a phoenix. Okay. And the fact that they're being lifted up out of what's like a crowd. Yeah, so we're gonna have you repeat all those excellent things one more time. Sorry about that. Yeah, you're totally um, fine. It reminds me of a phoenix that's being reborn, um, especially because of the color and the feathers, which are uh, evoke memories of what a phoenix looks like to me. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that it's being lifted up by two people out of like another crowd, it gives it effect that it is some sort of rebirth in a way. Yep. Fantastic. So she's wearing red and everybody else is in white, right? So she's obviously important. We might even have a question here about some schism between the time horizons that are happening, because we have half the people that are facing out and half the people that are sort of facing up. So maybe those people are watching some kind of dream or there's two different worlds that are happening. Obviously, just as our volunteer said, she's being elevated, she's got feathers on, she's in red, she's in the middle, so all of these other people are circling around her. So never having seen the Firebird from ABT, we can infer a lot about what's happening narratively just based on some of these visual cues to convey this legibility and intent. And we do the exact same thing when it comes to programming robots. So even if you've never seen a robot before, you have no idea what it's gonna be doing, the way that the robot moves can make it very clear whether it's a functional movement, a predictable movement, or a legible movement. And this is some canonical work in human robot interaction from Anka Dragon, who's at UC Berkeley. This was actually her thesis work when she was at CMU. And she found that the most direct path for a robot to grab a cup is not necessarily the one that's considered the most predictable, right? So the most legible movement, or excuse me, the most direct path is considered the most predictable. So if you want movement that's actually legible, if you want people to sort of understand what the robot is doing, it might be better for the robot to take a less optimal path and move around in a slight arcing motion. And so all of these kinds of subtle hints, they tell us a lot about what the robot wants, what it's trying to do, and choreographers are very well acquainted with how to make these kinds of subtle hints because they've embedded them inside of these narrative stories for so, so long. And then choreographers and roboticists, they need to make movement. I mean, in general, they have to make something move from zero. And so we think about what are methods that you can use to generate movement? I just described one. You can have a task, like grab a cup, and you can do the thing that is the most efficient performance of that task, which might be to optimize on the basis of distance, which probably optimizes on the basis of time. But maybe you actually don't want a robot to do things that are efficient. Maybe you want a robot to be acceptable or friendly or interesting or fun to be around. And so this was some work from Wendy Ju and David Serkin where they worked with a couple of actors to teleoperate this little motorized chair cushion and found out that maybe people would prefer to put their feet up if the robot does a little funny dance right before it comes right up to you. Maybe it's not so appealing to have this robot motorized ottoman just zoom right up to your feet and be ready to have your feet on top of them, right? So we have this design space that's much broader than what just thinking about having a robot be fast or efficiently performing a task. And this is some work from some of my collaborators at UIUC, uh, Umer and Amy, where they looked at we can have a walking robot that walks fast or walks well. Or, but what if we can just make a robot that walks in as many different ways as possible? And now we have this very fascinating design space where we get to pick and choose. Wow, I can have a robot that drags its feet, that shuffles, that staggers. What kinds of contexts would those robots be useful for? Right? So if I think about having a robot inside of, let's say, for example, a preschool, I don't know if I want the fastest robot, right? Maybe I want the most lovable robot. Maybe I want the one that has the most intriguing sets of design spaces so that kids don't get bored. These kinds of questions are the ones that we really need to unpack at this intersection of robotics and dance. And of course, I would be remiss if I did not remark upon the fact that there have been so many works made uh, by artists and choreographers with robots, essentially since robots have been widely available to the public. And these are only a very small sample. 
This is a very famous work from Stellark. He just stuck himself on the end of a robot and wiggled around. Uh, then we also have some black flags from William Forsyth, work from Palabolus. This was, at the time, the most robots to ever dance uh, at the same you know, cadence and be totally unison. Uh, we have some more modern work. This is just from the last couple of years. This is Madeline Gannon, Mimas. She worked with this big, beautiful ABB robot. Uh, Kim Baraka, some of his improvisational work. This is the Choreo Robotics class that's actually taught at Brown University. And then Amelia Virtue working with Kate Sicchio over at, um, I think it's Western Virginia. So hopefully I've convinced you of the fact that robotics and dance have a lot in common. And now I'm going to talk about one of my own projects uh, so you can understand a little bit about how this unfolds in practice. And this was the third chapter of my thesis. So some of the research context here, like why did we do this project? Uh, and I was an artist in residence at Everyday Robots, and we really wanted to create a compelling and rich experience that would increase positive emotional responses for our robots. So we were going to take them out of the building that they'd been in. We were going to situate them inside of all of these alphabet buildings. And we wanted people to have a really positive reaction to them. We didn't just want them to be there doing these quotidian, you know, human-facing tasks like wiping tables. We wanted them to be more compelling than that. And so in this project, we thought a lot, how do we foreground the technical contribution? We do something that's novel and deploys imitation learning in ways that it hasn't been deployed before. But we also foreground the sentiment. So we make it compelling to experience and delightful, interesting. We keep people engaged. And there's been a little bit of work in this domain. You know, of course, uh, it's sort of swarm legibility or human swarm interaction where you have a bunch of robots that are moving and there's some sort of gestures that are also being performed that the robots can respond to. And we were thinking about, like, how can we actually turn this together into this very cohesive set system? And this was the system design that we settled on. So we have this parent client. Uh, this is running, it's just a Python binary that's running on a workstation that I've SSH'd into. It's Linux workstation. And then we're port forwarding and connecting over to these clients that are on each individual robot. So each robot has a computer, and we're talking to the computer that's on that robot that has a Python client associated with it. And this is what we call our sort of client flocking service. And this client flocking service is comprised of these four different subcomponents. The arm service, so it's an algorithm that's dictating the movement of the robot's arm. The base service, so this is touching how the robot's base is actually navigating around. Choreography service, which these are all the things that respond to the gestures that we get from the humans. And the human tracking service that's checking to see how many humans are currently in the space alongside all of the robots. And then we duplicate this across many, many robots. So again, you have this one parent client that's running on a workstation. All of the robots are homogenous, they're all cooperative, and they're publishing this information about where they are, how their arms are moving, what they're doing at all times up to this parent client. Probably, you know, I think we ran it at 20 hertz, uh, which is fairly slow. Uh, but, you know, lots of information is being passed. We didn't want any robots to crash. And so this was the sort of overall structure. And then once we have this, what are we doing to each individual robot? Well, we have these base motions. So they're doing this default flocking behavior uh, that I'll describe a little bit further in a minute. And these are associated with these weight modes. So these are effectively some gains that are touching upon this default flocking behavior that are also responding to gestures. We've got our arm movements. So we're doing this sort of choreographed arm motion, but there's also a little force detection in the wrist that's stopping every time it bumps into somebody. And we're doing some responses with our gripper based on the other things that we're observing in our environment. Then we have our head controller that's sort of doing this default behavior and responding to gestures. We have this light ring that's in the head. So it's detecting some humans and it's changing based off of the gestures that it's getting. And then all these joints are playing something called music mode, which is a software that I've written a blog post about, but I won't have time to cover in this talk. Uh, essentially what music mode does is it maps the joint velocities, the target joint velocities of every joint on the robot to a sound sample so that the robot makes music while it moves. So the robot becomes an instrument simply by moving around. And that project we created because we had this sort of Subversive idea where people usually pick a piece of music and then make a choreography. And in our case, we could have the movement become the music. And that's what created music mode. So then we run music mode on all the joints. It's just running on the Android computer, and all the music is coming straight through the robot speaker. So this is how the base of the robot, this is Boyd's algorithm, is a very old school, canonical, well-known flocking algorithm. 
uh, from the 80s. I think it's got a bazillion citations. But we used Boyd's algorithm as a sort of underlying way to program the base. And what is Boyd's algorithm? So in Boyd's algorithm, we have cohesion. So we're giving a bump. We have a function, essentially, that's telling the robots to stay together. We have separation, which is a function to send the robots apart. And we have alignment, which is the robots to align their velocities, their speed and direction, roughly in the same space. And once we have this very old school Boyd's algorithm, which the implementation is completely up to you. There's no right way to do it. He basically wrote the rules for this on a sheet of paper and said, interpret this however you want. Uh, but we added all of these things on top. So we said, great, now that we can do those three things, let's also add a function that makes the robots move in a circle. Let's add one that has the robots following humans that are inside of the space. We can add another one that has them move along a line. And we also don't want them to bump into the side. So we're going to give them a little bit of a bounce version. And so for each individual robot, I showed you that system design. For each individual robot, we say, the next position is going to be a concatenation of each of these functions. So we have a gain that's being multiplied by this cohesion function. We're adding it for the separation, for the alignment, for the circular, for the follow, for the linear. This is all computing our next robot xy. We have all of these gains, right? Now we have a list of seven gains. We can set these gains however we want, and we wind up with these very different behaviors. Yeah? So here, I call a weight mode, essentially a collection of those gains. And here's, for example, like this adjoining behavior, is I can set all those gains in that long list to be different values. I have my six robots, which is depicted in these graphs. They start in light blue, they move into dark blue, and this is over time, right? So they move from this position to this position on the basis of these weight modes. All of which is to say, this is the, this is the sausage making of how you get robots to dance. Um, and this is what they look like. So this is all of our robots moving in a sort of fishbowl pattern. This one's at two times speed. This is our following behavior. So I can wander around in the space and we have the robots will come and follow me. We can make these robots move in these sort of parallel lines. And now we can train an agent to choose autonomously between all these different weight modes. So we can take an agent. We've got this list of weight modes. Those are all those plots that I showed you and those shapes in blue. I can write a series of hand-tuned features that describe what's happening inside of the system. I then have a choreographer, AKA me, who's selecting between these different weight modes while there's a human moving throughout the space. This is my initial labeled data set. And then I can predict. And the flock itself will pick the next weight mode to go to based on what's happening inside of the space. So we can train this agent to choose those patterns by itself. As if that was not enough, uh, we then also do some gesture recognition. So we have a human gesture detection that maps to these robot actions. So if a person in the space puts their left hand up, they're going to open and close their grippers, which triggers a bell sound. If they put their right hand up, the robots will stop and rotate in place. Or if they put their hands together, the robots will look up at the sky. And this is what those gestures look like. So there go my hands up, and all the robots peek up at the sky. Show this one more time. Here's Josh doing it. <gasps> hands together, kaboom. And we have Millie, who puts her left hand in the air, and the robots are going to open and close their grippers, which is a little hard to see, but it essentially triggers this bell sound from music mode. And on top of this, we've got our head controller. So this is dictating the movement of the head. If there's nobody in the space, look at the middle. Otherwise, look at the human. And our arm movement, of course, which has these joint trajectories that generate these different musical variations. And each of these robots is on a different cadence. So our generalized flocking algorithm is, while true, if we detect a gesture, respond to the gesture, non-blocking. So my other body parts can keep doing what they're doing, and I'll just do my gesture response. Otherwise, query my weight policy, so query my agent, iterate the base algorithm, iterate my arm motion, and iterate the head tracking. And this is what the whole thing looks like. Hopefully, the sound will work. <laughs> OK, I will play it for you now.
And all the music, again, that you hear, that's all being generated from the robot's movement. So the movement of the torso is that doom, doom, doom. And the movement of the arm is giving you that string sound. And the whole thing together is being played through these speakers. And kids, which are a very discerning audience, tend to very much like this, which means I think we're moving in the right direction. And I want to provide some quality. We actually ran a whole bunch of experiments about this. Stay tuned for the thesis if you want to nerd out about how people perceive this whole experience. But I think some important things to share are these qualitative uh, feedback descriptors that we got, because I think they very much capture, again, this goal that we had to have a strong technical contribution and a strong sentimental contribution. I feel like I'm in heaven. This is a very snarky engineer who said this to me. Um, am I ascending? They were so cute out there singing and dancing. I had no idea what they were actually meant to be doing, but it made me happy. This feels poetic. I'm having a visceral reaction. We had some people remark about how they looked like little ducklings. I feel like I'm watching an alien species performing or reminded me of watching an aquarium of fish. So much of my work has been about making robots more friendly interactive, easy to teach, and easy to navigate around. And to take it a step further, for humans to feel empowered around them, inspired, and to give them this artistic essence that elevates a robot from a tool to be a whimsical part of our everyday lives. So I get asked a lot of questions uh, about why should we do this. And I have a lot of really good arguments. We need to increase human well-being, robot legibility, human-robot collaborative effectiveness. But I think the more interesting question is why not? What kind of world do we want to live in? One where robots and our technologies make us feel fatigue, boredom, less human, or where we feel this proximity to and collaborations with our robots and our technologies that give us a sense of curiosity, joy, and deep humanness. That's a world that I'm much more interested in living in. And I really do think that it's possible. I showed you all these robots at the beginning of my talk. And believe it or not, there are ways to elevate these things from being tools to being these very evocative social agents that bring us joy, that make us laugh, that make us curious. And now that I've shown you a little bit about how we can make that happen, maybe it will inspire you to start thinking about the ways in which you can bring some of that whimsy, that creativity, that joy into the work that you do and into the things that you build and the world that you create. Would love to hear your thoughts. Thanks. <laughs>